If you're visiting with us, welcome. It is great to have you with us. We come together to study the Word of God, to praise the Lord Jesus as we come to sing praises, to study the Word, and to pray the Gospel. So we walk through books of the Bible. So in the last, I don't know how many months, we have been walking through the book of Matthew. In the last eight weeks, we have been walking through Matthew chapter 5. And today we will conclude chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. So if you have a Bible, please go to the book of Matthew. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, you can use one of those Bibles in front of you in the pew. Uh, and if you do not know where Matthew 5 is, you will find it in those Bibles in page 810. 810, you will find Matthew 5. And today we'll read verses 38 through 48. In fact, if you don't have, this is something that our team put together, uh, this bookmark right here. It tells you where the books of the Bible, you can find them. And also it tells you what passage you will be preaching next week and the following week so that you can read it perhaps ahead of time and come prepared to receive the message. And also on that you have a QR code where you can find the notes that I upload, an outline of my message. You can have it and you can follow. You can use that even to read with a friend for discipleship and evangelistic purposes. You can get together with another friend on Starbucks and can just go through the notes of the message and there are questions that we put together for you. Use that. In this page, also the secure code for giving. So for those, for you who are members of the church, for your giving and tithe and offerings, you can use the secure code and give online. Okay, let's go to Matthew now. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God. Matthew 5, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone will sue you and take your tunic, tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you might be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greed only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You're, you therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God. You might be seated. So we come to the climax of chapter 5, perhaps the highest point on the Sermon of the Mount. Perhaps this passage is one of the reasons that this sermon is admired and resented. Some people love these verses, some people dislike these verses. Because these verses are calling us to love all people, including those who have hurt us, to love even our enemies. Nowhere is the challenge of the sermon greater. Nowhere is the distinctiveness of the Christian more obvious. And nowhere is our need of the Holy Spirit more compelling. We cannot do this apart from the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. Words and actions they walk together. And Christ is demanding us to love. 
So this is what I would like to do this morning. I want to give you what is the main thought or the main idea that this passage, these verses are communicating. And then I would like to draw three practical points as we walk through these verses. So this, let me give you kind of the main thought. This is the main thought. In light of insults, criticism, and injustices, trust God, act humbly, and love all. In light of insults, criticism, and injustices, trust God, act humbly, and love all. That is the main message that these verses are communicating to us. Now, as we walk through the verses, let me give you first the first point. The first point is this. Refuse to answer evil with evil. Do not let the sin of others lead you to sin. Refuse to answer evil with evil. Do not let the sin of others lead you to sin. Read with me verse 38 again. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to him, the other also. So in the context here, this is what Christ is doing. This is kind of the structure of the whole passage. And he has been doing this for the last few weeks. Uh, first, he gives you a quote from the Old Testament. And then with that quote, he gives you kind of the interpretation of that quote. How people in the first century are reading that verse. And then he gives you the right meaning, the, the deepest meaning of the passage. And then he shows you how that applies, the applications of that. Like the right cheek, that's one application of that. Go the extra mile, that's an application of that. To give them your tunic, that's an application of that. The challenge for us here is, is that we don't get it because the application made sense in the first century. But today, 2,000 years after, we like, what? Tunic? Coat? Cloak? What is I mean, we don't, we don't use those. What does that mean? Well, that, it has a meaning. As we walk through that, you will see it. I will show it to you. So, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This is what is called the lex talioni, or the law of retaliation. Uh, the expression, uh, the lex talioni, comes from the Latin. La lex is law, the law of retaliation. And it is in the Bible. But it's not only in the Bible. Many sources use the same principle. The Code of Hammurabi has this as well. The whole legal system today is influenced by this expression, or by this principle of lex talioni. So we can read for exa one example of that in Exodus 21, verses 23 through 25. And we have it right here. Exodus 21, verses 23 through 25. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Do you see the point? That was in the Old Testament. That was the law. And the law was meant to be used only by the judges and the court. And the law was meant to restrain evil and retaliation. For example, if someone will come and punch me, then I will kill the whole family, that would be a disaster for the whole society. And that was happening in the first century. So the law was meant to use to be used by the judges and the court to restrain evil, to put down retaliations. I mean, my oldest son said, I don't know, a couple years ago, he said, Dad, I want 
us to watch a movie together. I said, let's do it. I will not give them the name of the movie. It was very violent. Um, and I'm watching the movie. It's like, the guy is driving this vehicle. His dog got killed. And now he killed the whole town, basically. <laughs> it's, it's like, whoa, they need Lex Talioni. I mean, he is like, I mean, it's, if someone kills your dog, that's really bad. But you should not kill the whole town just because of that. So the Lex Talioni was meant to be used by the courts to prevent that kind of behavior. But here, this is what's happening. With the help of the teachers of the law, people were using the law for personal offenses. So they took justice on their own hands, and they are executing justice, and they're retaliating to all people just because of offenses that they received. And Jesus is communicating to them, you are corrupting the meaning, the intention of the law, and you are in sin. And the Pharisees were supporting this, and Jesus says, my disciples, they need to do better. That is the whole context here. The point here is do not be vengeful, vigilante. There's a righteousness greater and more beautiful than self-justice. Do not take your own vengeance, but let God, the one who judges justly, to make things right. Trust yourself to the Lord. The expression that we use, I do not get mad, I get even, is unbiblical, is unchristian. And that is the point here. I think Romans 12, verses 17 through 21, illustrate the point here. This is Paul writing to the church in, in Rome. This is what he says. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that is the point. Often the righteous thing to do is to be run by another. Often the righteous thing to do is not to seek our own justice. It's to trust the Lord. If someone sin against you, do not sin against that person. The sins of others should not justify your sin. If someone sinned against you, you should not respond in a sinful way. The sin of others do not give you license to sin. That is the point here. My people are not vengeful. They're not going after the other because they want to destroy others. That is the point here. So that's point one. Point number two, which will explain the following verses. When you experience insults, criticism, and injustice, respond with a humility that glorifies God. When you experience, you see, when you, because you will, when you experience insults, criticism, and injustice respond with a humility that glorifies God. 
That's the point here. Read with me in verse 39 and 40. It says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Okay, so these verses have been misunderstood by a lot of people throughout history. Some people have used these verses to argue against capital punishment. Some people have used these verses to talk about pacifism. Some people have used these verses to tell that the Christian should never, be, should never respond to any kind of physical attack. Let me tell you, that is not what these verses are. Are teaching. These verses are idiomatic expressions that were used in the first century that people, when Jesus said that, they got it. For example, let me go with the first one. Slap in the right cheek. That is, was an idiom, an idiomatic expression that was meant as an insult. That is a deep insult. Someone insulted you. That is what it means. It's not talking about physical attack. For example, it's not saying like someone comes with a baseball bat, hits you, and then you say, you know what? Let me put the other side now, hit me here. That's not the point of that. If someone comes to your house and attack your, is attacking your children, they say, well, Jesus says that we should not respond evil, so let's go ahead and do it. No, that is not the point. You should respond, and you should defend your family. This is an idiomatic expression. We use that all the time in English. When he says, when you slap someone on the right cheek, most people, like 92% of the world population is right-handed. If you're lefty, you are part of the 7, 8% of the world. So meaning, for me, if I slap someone, I would never hit them on the right cheek, always on the left one. But if I hit them with the back of my hand, I would hit them in the right cheek. So meaning this, you hit them with the back of the hand, you are insulting them. We use the same in English. For example, in English, we say a back handed compliment. That is not a compliment. It's an insult. For example, one example of a backhanded compliment. That was a great job, even for someone like you. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, no, no, thank you. You're insulting me. I would like, you go into the salon and you get a, a new haircut. Wow, you got a haircut. You look interesting. <laughs> they, are not, they are not giving you a compliment. Wake up, it's an insult. So the same here. It's an idiomatic expression that is meant as a deep insult. The problem is when we read it 2,000 years after, we don't get it. One, one idiomatic expression we use in English is, it's raining cats and dogs. Let's say 500 years from today, someone is reading that today in Tampa was raining cats and dogs. They were like, what? Cats are coming from the sky? Dogs are coming from the sky? No. But even today, not 500 years from today, even today, if you have someone from another country and you teach them English, and they know what rain is, what a dog is, what a cat is, and they read today, cats and dogs raining, they would not get it. Because the words in their context, when they put together, they mean something specific. And a slap in the right cheek meant something. It meant an insult. And what Jesus says here is, if someone is insulting you, let it be. They're gossiping around you about you. They're labeling you. They don't agree with you. And because of that, they are creating false witness. 
they are labeling you, oh, that person is X, Y, and Z. Don't go back, you say, no, you are X, Y, and Z. Just let it go. Trust yourself to God. Trust yourself to God. They're lying about you. God is watching. What God hears, he's listening. Just let the Lord bring justice. Don't try you to bring justice yourself. That is the point here. Uh, I think Peter, in First Peter, shows us that Jesus is the right example of this. First Peter 2, verse 23, he says, and this is the New Living Translation, First Peter 2, verse 23, he did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten re revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. When Christ was insulted, he did not insult back. He trusted God who judges justly. That is the point here. If they insult you, and if they speak evil about you with their friends, let them say what they want to say. They're putting a label on you, let them put a label on you. They're questioning your motives, let them do it. God judges justly. God knows people's heart. He knows how self-righteous they are. But God will judge. But you know what is dangerous and even tricky about this? The human heart is so tricky. We can do the right thing even with the wrong heart. Sometimes people will gossip about you. They will lie about you. And you will say, I will not do anything. I hope they die, you know. But, what I, <laughs> but I, I will not do anything. And you say, like, I will just ignore them. But in your heart, you're creating all these movies, John Wick kind of type of movie, and you're killing all of them. <laughs> you want to destroy them. And Christ is telling us, not only to do the right thing, is to have the right heart. But that's only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. The natural person cannot do this. Only through Christ we can do it. The next illustration he uses, a tunic and a cloak. I have a picture here to illustrate you, a tunic and a cloak. People don't use that today, they don't know. So a tunic is the kind of the, the you see the, the white one? That's the tunic. The cloak is the gray one. So in the Old Testament, there was a law. Let's go to Exodus 22, verses 25 and 27. Exodus 22, verses 25 and 27. This is a law. It says, if you lend money to any of my people, with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. Verse 26, if ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall not return it to him before the sun. You shall return to him before the sun goes down, for that is the only covering. It is the cloak for his body. In what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So there was a law in the Old Testament that if someone would sue you, they could take the tunic, and they could even take the jacket, the coat, but they have to go back during the evening and return it to you so that you could protect yourself. Why? In the desert, it is really hot during the day but it's really cold during the nights. And the temperatures will drop. And people without a jacket or a coat, they could die. And sometimes they will use that 
as, as kind of as a pillow to, to sleep. So they were not supposed to take the coat. So Christ says, if they want to take advantage of you and they take the tunic, give them even the coat. Because you don't have to give them to that. Just go the extra mile, so to speak, and just give it to them. Show them grace, even when they do not need it. Jesus calls his disciples to go beyond what the law requires. Respond to your accuser with grace. This is a radical, unselfish attitude. And this attitude will amaze the world. It will invite the blessing and the pleasure of our Heavenly Father, who's watching and witnessing what is taking place. In each of these, Christ is illustrating the heart of a disciple. It's not like a list of laws. It's more like the principle, the attitude of compassion, of humility that a disciple of Christ needs to have. That suit, for example, it's not like, you know, if you're in a car accident, a lot of those in Florida, uh, if you're in a car accident, and someone sues you, and they want your car, why do you throw your house as well? That's not what he's saying here. It's like, well, the point here is, show grace, even to those who are evil and insulting you. The other one, like, go the extra mile. You see that one in verse 41? And if anyone forces you to go one mile, Go with him two miles. Some of you will benefit of going the extra mile, let me tell you. <laughs> it will be good for the health. Uh, the point here is, this is what was going on. There was a law in the first century. Israel was occupied by the Romans. So the Romans came and they took over Israel, uh, Jerusalem, the whole uh, country of Israel. So they were oppressing them. And the Romans, had a law that a Roman person, especially a Roman soldier, could ask someone who was not a citizen of Rome to help them with their burden. For example, if this guard is coming from Rome and he has his bag, which is heavy, and he sees a Hebrew, say, hey, you, come here, take my bag and walk one mile with me. If the Hebrew rejects to help, he will be taken to prison and he will be punished. But the law only, say, only said one mile. So the person would take it, go one mile. When you get to the one mile, you drop it and you go your way. The Hebrews, the Jews hated that law because it was a picture of humiliation. These Romans are coming here and they're humiliating us. It was a reminder to them that they were occupied by Rome. And Jesus says, when those Romans come to you and they say, take my back one mile, you do it. But then you say, you know what? I will go with you an extra mile. Basically, disarm them with kindness. Show them grace. And that grace and that kindness will be used to God to draw people to himself. Because they will not be able to understand. Who are you? You don't need to help me. You don't need to do this. Why are you showing me grace when you don't need to do that? Why? So, well, now that you ask, because I serve the Lord Jesus, he came to serve, not to be served, and he came to save us from our sins, and you and I need to be saved. So do you know Jesus? Something like that, to present the gospel to them. In the first century, God used the humility of the Christians to save 
thousands and thousands of Romans because they've obeyed the Lord Jesus. This reminds me of a missionary. There was this lady a few years ago. She was telling the story. Uh, she went to China, and she was working in China as in a platform, uh, working for a business in China to evangelize Chinese. Uh, so she, she would go to an office, and then she worked in that office, she would develop friendships, and the Lord blessed her work. It became very fruitful. And many people were saved through her. And after that, a church was planted. And many of the people who came to that church were people that she led to the Lord. So that came to the attention of the government. She did not know that the government was watching. One day, she goes to her office, like every day, and her boss says, the police is here. They want to see you. So she goes into a room with police officers, and they say, tell us what you are doing. We know that you are a spy, and you will be punished. You will go to prison. But she was not budging. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you want me to do? We know that you're a spy. He said, I'm not a spy. So they took her home to her house, and they were searching everything in her house, her bedroom, her bed, everything, the closet. They, took, they, they opened everything. They said, tell us the truth. You are a spy. Tell us. She said, I'm not a spy. So you have one night. Think about it. If you don't tell us everything we want to know, you go to prison and you'll be punished. So they left. When I say prison in China, it's not like the ones that we have here. And so she was, I mean, she was shaken. So she prayed and she said, Lord, you promised to give me the words to say in situations like this. And I'm trusting you to keep your promises. Give me words. I don't know what to do. So she prayed. Next morning, she goes to the office. They're waiting for her. Now they have five officers. They said, you go to the police station with us. So they took her. Now they're interrogating, harassing her. And she said, you are so kind. Thank you. You love your country. And they look at her. I said, you love your country so much that you want to defend your country. I really respect that. How are you doing? And I said, you don't understand what we're telling you. We know that you're a spy. And then she says, I'm not a spy. And then she said, but I have something to say to you. And she said, I want you to know that I'm thankful for you because you really care about your country. And then she looked to a female officer and she said, you are the most beautiful police of female officer in this country. And the lady looked at her like, she's yet, like, thank you in Chinese. And they don't know what to do with her. And then she said, they said to her, do you realize what is happening here? We know who you are. You are sharing about Jesus and, begin, and planting churches. We will punish you. You will be, you'll be in prison. We know. And she said, I will gladly go to prison to prove you that Jesus loves the people of your country. If you want me to put me in, to put me in prison, I'll be happy to do so 
if that proves you that Jesus loves you. I will be happy to die if that will prove you how much Jesus loves you because he came to die for your sins. They saw her, and one of them said, she's crazy, let her go. And she was let go. <laughs> she could have said, if you touch me, the U.S. Embassy is coming after you and you'll be destroyed. Marines will come to rescue me. He didn't say any of that. She just showed kindness. And she used that as a platform to present the gospel to them. That is what Jesus is asking us to do here. That in, the, in face, when we're facing insult, accusations, lies, persecution, show humility and love. That is what Christ is asking of us. Let the insults come and show by your response that you feel no need for retaliation because you have your reputation secure with God as his son or daughter. Let your response to insult be gracious because you have received grace from your heavenly Father. Brothers and sisters, we have insulted God with our sins. But God showed us mercy in Christ. And Christ is demanding that we will show to others the same grace that we have received from him. Show humility and grace even to those who persecute us. Number three. As disciples of Christ, we are supposed to love others the way God has loved us in Christ. Love all people. As disciples of Christ, we are supposed to love others the way God has loved us in Christ. Love all people. Read with me verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbors and hate your enemy. Okay, this is the problem with that quote. You will not find that quote in the Old Testament. Because the Bible never says, hate your enemies. But that was the norm in the first century. Christ here is quoting Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, 18 says, let's see Leviticus 19, verse 18. It says, you shall not take vengeance over a grudge against the sons of your own people. Then he comes, for you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You know, for those of you who normally at the beginning of the year begin to read the Bible through Genesis, then you go to Exodus, and then you go to Leviticus, and then it's done. When you get to the videos and you're about to give up, read that verse and then jump to Numbers. Uh, but don't give up your reading of the Bible. But when Christ says, love your neighbors, it's coming from Leviticus. But he says, love your neighbors as yourself. But this is what was happening. They dropped yourself. And then they took a interpretation of that verse that corrupted the teaching of God. This is what they did. So God says, love your neighbor. And they say, who's my neighbor? Well, my neighbor are those who, my family, those who are next to me, and perhaps the whole nation of Israel, the Jewish people, perhaps them too. So if God says, love my neighbor, that means that I'm not supposed to love those who are not my neighbors, meaning that I could hate those who are not my neighbors. And that became the standard interpretation. And Christ says, you are corrupting the Bible, and you add into the Bible. But I say to you, 
Verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then he asked them a couple questions. Rhetorical question, he says in verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you know even the tax collectors do the same? Then 47, he says, if you greet only your brothers, what more do you, are you doing than others? Do you know even the Gentiles do the same? So Christ, he says, you Pharisees, you say that you are righteous, and you boast about your righteousness, but you're the same as the people that you consider the least righteous. The tax collectors and the Gentiles. The tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. Why? Because the tax collectors were Jewish who allied themselves with Rome to take advantage of their own people. The tax collectors, they were in bed with Rome to take money from themselves and to rob the people. Think about there was a movie in the 80s, uh, James Bond, License to Kill. Uh, this tax collector had license to steal. They were endorsed by Rome to take money from others, as long as they sent a significant percentage to Rome. So the people hated them, but they also hated the Gentiles. And Jesus says, if you only love those who are like you, if you only love those that you agree with, if you only love the small group of friends that you have, if you only love the people that have the same uh, preferences that you have, if you only love the people who look like you, you are like the rest of the lost people. You are like the Gentiles and the tax collectors. So Jesus says, my disciples, those who have received grace from me need to show grace and love for those who are not like them including your enemies. This is very difficult because we don't want to do that. We don't want to love those who hurt us. We don't want to love those who do not like us. And in our society, we're, everything is about right. My right to do this, my right to do this, and everything is about me. That is not biblical. Christ says it is not about you. It is about you showing the grace that you have received from God through you. I remember this lady. I mean, love is so difficult. I talk with people and I listen to people. A lot of people are angry. We are so full of ourselves, so concerned with our rights. And we make law out of our preferences. We only love them as long as they agree with us. This lady came to me. She's so sweet. She said, Pastor, I love you. I agree with everything you say. And I'm like, hmm. I wonder if you're going to love me the day that I disagree with you. I didn't say that, of course. I just thought about it. I didn't want to ruin the moment. Uh, <laughs> but it's like that. I love you because I agree with you. Christ says, you need to love them when you disagree with them. Oh, I don't agree with him. I'm going after that person. Christ says, that is unchristian. And he says, in verse 45, for, say, lo, for, 44 says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 45, he says, so that you might be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He makes his son rise on the evil one and on the good ones. He sends rain 
on the just and the unjust. See, God shows grace to all people. We need rain. It's so dry. It's so hot. Well, God says, hmm, let me see that subdivision right there. There's a Christian right here. I will send, send rain on that house. The next one is a pagan. No rain for them. He doesn't do that. He sends rain on, on all people. He shows grace to all people. He said, my people should be like that. They should show grace to all people. The good ones and the bad ones. The one you like and the one you don't like. We love because we have been loved. First John makes this point. Quickly, let me see First John. First John 3, 2 and 3, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. I mean, we will be like him, like Jesus, like God, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who does hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. In, verse, in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, this is what he says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Meaning, if you hate people, that's what it says. If you know God, you will love, because God is love. I mean, it's very straightforward. We can only do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the flesh, we cannot do it. We need God to do it. And he says, pray for them. I will tell you this. If you struggle with a person, pray for them. I will tell you, I think it is impossible for you to hate a person that you pray for. If they're insulting you, if they're talking about you, pray for them. If they're mean to you, pray for them. Pray for them. I used this illustration on Wednesday evening, maybe six months ago. So I grew up in Dominican Republic. So as any Dominican boy, my dream was to play professional baseball. It did not work. Um, so when I was in high school, I, I wanted to get better. So I had a coach. My coach said, you need to get stronger. You need muscles. You're weak. It's OK. So he sent me to the gym. So I went to this gym. I mean, it's nothing like here. It was in the, in the back of a house. And, and I remember the first time I went, 40 pounds, I could not bench them. I could not bench 40 pounds. I was struggling. But th this guy, his name is Ludo Vino. We, call, we used to call him D Ludo, L-U-D-O. This guy is like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, huge. And he will come with 40 pounds, 40 pounds, 40 pounds, 40 pounds, 40 pounds, 40 pounds, and nothing. Like, he could bench like 300 pounds. And then he will go, like, who's this guy? This is impressive. And then he would take a juice, something green, and with a powder, and he would shake it and drink it. I think it was illegal. Uh, it's one of those vitamins that will ban you from professional sports. Uh, the juice that he was, I don't know. But he was drinking that. And he was huge. I mean, his arms were bigger than my legs. And he would go measure his arm, like how big. I mean, he would work out, then measure himself. It's so, so strange. And then he would walk around, look himself in the mirror, you know, this kind of thing. Like, why are you doing that? It's weird. But he was doing that. So I said, this guy is impressive. He must be a vigilante fighting criminals in the streets. Well, no, he was not. I learned that he was a paralegal. He would spend eight hours a day just typing in a computer. <laughs> I 
<laughs> like that guy with those arms, you're going to break the keyboard like that. Why do you need all that strength? Well, he needed all that strength because he just wanted to watch himself in the mirror. Christians can be like that. We received the love of God and we do nothing. We receive the grace and the love of God, and we just watch ourselves in the mirror. God did not love us so that we will feel good about ourselves. He loved us because He loved us, and He loved us because He wanted us to show His love to all people, including those who have hurt us, including our enemies. This is what he's asking us to do. This is radical. But you will tell me, Pastor, it's so difficult to love that person. I said, I will give that to you. There are people that are difficult to love. God gave his son for us. It was difficult for God to love us. Because by loving us, he gave his son to die for us. His love for us was costly. It was free to us, but it was not free for him. But he loved us. So I pray that we'll be marked by that love. And that God will use that love to bring people to himself. And if you are here and you're not a Christian, I will tell you it is impossible for you to do that. This is only possible in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ loved us when we were dead in our sins and trespasses. And he's inviting you to trust himself and to receive the love of the Father through him. In a moment we will sing, pastors will be here. I invite you, give your life to Christ. Trust Jesus, believe his name, and he will save you, and he will transform you. We do not love so that we will be loved by God. We love because we have been loved by God. Love is not something that we do to earn His grace. Love is something that we do to show that we have been saved. Love others. Pastor Brandon, can you lead us in worship? Please stand.